Um, moving on to the, the create step. So when we start software development, we do need to do some planning ahead of time. Uh, the, the easy one, the low hanging fruit is, what are we gonna write this in? You know, I, I've mentioned Forda supports JavaScript, TypeScript and Python. Uh, we have done both JavaScript and Python. So we have a lot of examples in our code repository. I encourage you to check it out on, on GitHub. Um, and, uh, and so what, are, what am I most familiar with? What is my team most familiar with? You know, know what language you're gonna start with and then try to plan out how many agents do I need to accomplish this task? Maybe they've asked me for 10 different things that they want to monitor, uh, but they're all very similar. If they are very similar, then it's possible you can have one agent that can emit multiple alerts based on those 10 conditions. If those 10 conditions are very uh, dissimilar from one another, it may make more sense to, to write separate what we call handlers. Uh, so basically kind of like separate JavaScript modules or Python modules for each of those 10 tasks, and then have a central module that kind of collects all of these alerts to send on to the scan node where the, where the code runs. Um, we typically have grouped all of our handlers together, our separate modules together into what we call agent suites. And that really simplifies and, and helps us when we publish, and, and even more so when we want to maintain and either add functionality or, or make any bug fixes that we find. Um, so that, that's kind of this, this critical planning step, just blueprint, how many do I think I'm going to need rather than just diving right in. When we set up the repository, uh, we highly recommend if you haven't done it already uh, to, to look at the Ford, Ford agent examples repository. It, it's a good place to start, provides a pretty good framework for what your repository could look like, both for those kind of single agent cases or the, the multiple agent, uh, uh, agent, multiple handler agent suites that we were talking about. Um, please, 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 if, if, if you're going to go through with this endeavor, and I encourage you to uh, update the fields in your package.json, you know, just give your, give your agent a name, you know, uh, start with 0.0.1 .0 for the version, make sure you lay out the packages that are required, you know, think of if you were running somebody else's code, you'd want to know some details about it ahead of time and package.json is, is that great collection point for all of your NPM install needs. Um, so be a good neighbor, do that. Um, as far as the, the shared resources, you might have these multiple agents and they're all gonna need access to these addresses and these, uh, these ABIs for the contracts. Uh, it's, it's good to keep those in a central place, whether that's a central directory, maybe a few uh, data files like JSON files that all of your, your agents can access. Uh, some of these protocols will provide an NPM package. We encourage you to, to go that route because those will give you up-to-date addresses and up-to-date ABIs in case anything does change. Uh, or you may have to go digging in the GitHub repository for that protocol. Uh, and then please also use Etherscan uh, or, or other blockchain explorers. They're great resources. A lot of times they will have the ABI published there uh, as well as the, the contract source code that was compiled for the contract that's actually deployed. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time on Etherscan as we start going through the development of these agents. Uh, if there's anything that you need to run your agent that is outside the source directory, uh, update your Docker file. Uh, you'll be glad you did because it's a rude surprise to find out that your, your Docker image or your Docker container is not running because you forgot to copy something into it. So just make sure you get everything in there uh, ahead of time. Uh, and then also maybe some common configuration parameters uh, can, can be stored in, in another JSON file. Uh, we do this because it's easy for the protocols to see where the thresholds are stored. So do I trigger on a $10 million value? Do I trigger on a $50 million value? You know, what, how, how do I kind of turn the knobs on this agent if I want to? It, it really helps a, a protocol and a, a, a team to look at your stuff and know very, very quickly you know, how to turn those knobs. And, and again, the, the protocol Everest ID, please include that as well. It, it really just saves a lot of time once the alerts start coming. So there are two principal ways that you are, are going to make your agent. Uh, are you gonna process transaction by transaction? So all the transactions that occur in a block, are you gonna be looking for those events, looking for those functions? If you are, then the handle transaction code pattern or the handle transaction functions are, are, are the way you're gonna wanna implement that. Um, on the other hand, if what you're looking for is changes that occur block to block, but may not specifically be from an event that it's emitted or some function that gets called, 
uh, you're going to want to use handle block that will allow you to dig down in and see did the account balance change did the liquidity the amount of liquidity change uh, from that block to this one and and that's basically going to be this periodic trigger that every at this point, I, I think I last saw it was like about 13.7 seconds. But yeah, on the order of 14, 15 seconds, um, that you're going to get that update to check did something change? Did something change? So these are kind of the two main code patterns for for scanning events uh, or scanning transactions and and blocks. Uh, as I said, you want to know where this is running. What what blocks is this running against? Uh, right now. As I said, uh, Forda supports Ethereum mainnet. So that's where the scan node, which is where your agent is going to be running, that scan node is going to be pushing those blocks and those transactions directly to your agent. So that's kind of the principal mechanism. Every time a block is mined and that block is made up of transactions, that's going to get pushed through into your code and your code gets a chance to, to run through and look for those suspicious or anomalous events. Uh, it is absolutely a top priority. Uh, we we have uh, have had a number of conversations, as have the other development partners with the Forda team, about you know how how to move into another network and what that network's going to be. So that is absolutely in the works right now. Um, so look for that, and uh, again in the Forda Discord when those announcements get made, um, that'll be good. Um, then also currently for any networks that aren't supported yet. Uh, if you have a JSON RPC URL or, or API that you can that you can hit to make JSON RPC calls, um, you can do that. It, uh, the the Forda agents allow it, but note that this is it's a bit of a workaround for the moment. So we we've called it a hack. You know maybe that's a, a an uncharitable way of calling it. Um, you will be able to access that information. You will be able to scan that, but they will not correlate with the links that are provided in Forda Explorer right now. Um, so again, look for more updates on that. This is continually improving. We're, we're glad to be a part of that and helping that improve. Um, but that is, is an option to you. If you need to reach out to any external APIs, uh, maybe you want to reach out to Coin, CoinGecko and get a, get a price from there. Maybe you want to reach, reach out to Etherscan to get uh, an ABI or code or, or, or other things. Uh, Ford agents do allow that. And so you can open an external port, you can make some get requests with something like Axios, or, or if you want to go a little bit lower down and do a fetch, you can do that. Um, but you need to be wary of how many requests your agent's going to be making for each block or each transaction, and compare that to what the limitations are of the service that you're using. Uh, we absolutely, like as, as uh, wholeheartedly as possible, do not use any external API that requires credentials, API keys, anything you pay for, do not include that in your agent. Because when this gets deployed, this is going out into the wild. Yeah, you don't run the scan node, you don't own it. Uh, who knows how many requests are gonna get made. Uh, we, we highly recommend using whatever free tiers or, or, or public, uh, publicly available uh, endpoints are available. Um, Go that route. Um, don't don't submit your creds. That's, that's just good advice in general. Um, but you can make these requests. You can check things externally, and you can include that in in your logic. Uh, we want to give a special shout out to the Ethers JS uh, JavaScript library. I mean, this is your bread and butter right here. So there are a lot of functions that are built into it, a lot of classes and objects that really make this a lot simpler for any EVM compatible blockchain. Uh, we've used this uh, obviously with Ethereum, uh, which is the, the easy one, but um, you know Avalanche we recently did some work for, which is EVM compatible and works the same way. It's fantastic. Uh, I've, I've lay, uh, labeled out a few of those right here that we uh, use quite a bit. Parsing, uh, the parse log function that allows you to basically extract important information from these events as they come through. Um, something that just went into Ethers recently called the JSON RPC batch provider. It, it's not actually in the documentation yet, as far as I can tell. Uh, but if you dig into their pull requests, it was included recently. This is a fantastic thing that will actually take many, many uh, JSON RPC calls and batch them into a single uh, HTTP request. And it's constantly running in the background. So it's this, this beautiful transparent way of kind of saving on your HTTP requests. So you're not hitting those limits as quickly. Um, contract, I think that's a pretty straightforward one. This is how you're going to interact with those contracts that are deployed uh, on the blockchain. Um, 
for your own sanity, being able to format values that come out of ethers. Uh, format ether is fantastic. And then for whenever you want to take a value and put it back in, uh, parse ether is kind of the, the opposite operation that will really help you with this encoding and decoding so that you're not frustrated about what this, this hex value is in front of you. Uh, and then for tests, which I'll get into more, there are some really, really great kind of primitives in there for, for writing tests, for kind of um, mocking out or, or, or representing hashes and addresses uh, that can really help you streamline your tests and make them look slick. Uh, we have a little bit of work that we've done in Python. There is a Web3 package there, so we, we would point you to that if, if that's your flavor of, of programming that you prefer. Uh, but one way or another, these libraries, these Web3 libraries are, are indispensable. Um, and now kind of at the edges of, of what we've done, you know, we've had an opportunity to do some pretty unique things in these agents, and we look forward to more of it. Um, but as you start to uh, test the limits of, of what you think an agent can do, you'll find you can actually help extend it. So uh, for, for outliers in data, statistical outliers in data, well, what defines an outlier uh, other than knowing what a lot of the data looks like already? So we have a rolling math library that we've put out that basically keeps track of this, this kind of moving average. And every time another value comes in, it's able to compare that value to kind of this history of data. You can kind of envision, you know, the stock market typically goes, goes up and down quite a bit in any given day. You're not so interested in those ups and downs. You're interested in anything that's really, really outside that regular variance. So using a moving average filter kind of helps with that process. Um, if you have something that's going to take longer than the 13 or 14 seconds between blocks to do, um, you can set up uh, basically an asynchronous process that's going to be running continually. And then every time a block comes in, your handle block function can kind of check on the status of it and say, is it done yet? Okay, if it's done, submit some findings. If it's not done yet, just wait until it is. And if it's finished, kick it off again and start over. Uh, we had one of those recently where we had, had to scan thousands of positions and it just wasn't gonna happen in 14 or 15 seconds. And so we basically check it each time a block comes in, uh, send up the findings when they're uh, submitted and, and then uh, kick off the process again. And then I, I can't say this one enough, please be a good neighbor. Do not spam alerts. If you're going to come out with an agent that you expect or have any idea that it might, it might send out an alert every block or every transaction, uh, heaven forbid that, um, you know, consider finding a way to limit the number of alerts that are emitted. You know, it, it does nobody any good if if we have like the boy who cried wolf, you know, and, and these things are just sending alerts out because then nothing looks like an alert. It's just spamming constantly. So if you're going to expect very, very frequent alerts, consider limiting that to maybe, you know, some number per hour or even some number per day. We had an alert that was going to fire every single block because the condition was always being met, but it was it needed it needed. Uh, attention from that protocol. And so we came up with a way of tracking how many events would have been emitted over a day. And at the end of that 24 hour period, we set, submitted one finding that said, look, here's your finding, but I would have submitted however many, 2000 if, if, if I had uh, submitted constantly. 